So we talked about two organelles that make proteins. What are the two organelles that we talked about that make proteins? No, organelles. Oh, organelles. Oh, dear Lord. Yeah, what did you say? Ribosomes. I thought I was right. No, that's something different. Isosomes don't make proteins. Ribosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic Oh, there you go. This is page 19 of the notes. If you happen to have those notes in front of you, at the bottom of that page, remember I said ribosomes are like a gas grill. If you want a cheeseburger, I'll make you a cheeseburger, but you got to bring me all the parts. Ribosomes make proteins, they assemble them. But you have to bring them all the parts in order for them to assemble them. And then I said the endoplasmic reticulum is like the whole restaurant, it makes the protein. It has all the components. Boy. I said lysosomes are like little bags of digestive enzymes. They go like trucks full of lysol. And what do lysol kill? Germs. Yes, pathogens. So that lysosome is carrying enzymes that can destroy pathogens, as an example. I'll show you some of that a little bit later on. Um, and what was the what were now was the power plant? Mitochondria. Yes, mitochondria. Thank God. Did anybody under the email? Put email. 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 I said mitosis is the process of cellular division. Uh, the first thing the cell is going to copy before it divides is the DNA. So when that cell divides, it's going to copy its DNA. So it puts its DNA on a copy machine, makes a copy of it. Now you have an exact replica, pretty much. And then it copies all the other organelles and then splits in two. Now you have an exact copy of the whole cell. But here's what you have to realize, and please realize. When that cell makes a copy of itself, and it copies the DNA, that new cell has a copy of the DNA, not the original, right? So then that cell will later go on to copy itself, which means that DNA is going to be copied. So we're going to end up with a copy from a copy. And then later that new cell is going to make a copy of itself, and it's going to copy its DNA. So we're going to have to make a copy from a copy of the copy of the DNA. And then after that, that new cell is going to have to copy itself, make a copy from a copy of the copy of the copy from a copy of the copy from the copy of the DNA. So what happens over time when you copy something like that? Make change to the copy. What happens to the directions? They get mixed up, like whisper down. They change. They get difficult to read or unreadable. If they're unreadable, remember saw the on up on the board. Mm -hmm. Don't shake your head now. Remember saw the on. Yes. Up here, ladies. Remember this up on the board. Yes. And I said if you had to come into class and I wrote directions on the board and I wrote saw the on, could you read that? Nope. What would you do? Nothing. Nothing. So would you make an enzyme? Nope. nope. So after a while, if those directions become difficult to read. We'll make, we'll make certain things, which means that new cell is going to be exactly the same as the last. No. Which means the cell has changed. What do we call it when cells change? Cancer. cancer. So is that why you're saying if we live long enough? If we live long enough, cancer will come. Gotcha. It will greet us. We talked about necrosis, unscheduled cell death. And when cells are dying, 
They send out a chemical message, a 911 call, and who comes? Who shows up to help everybody. out that cell? Everybody. And what do we call that process of everybody rushing to the scene? Inflammation. Inflammation. And then what follows inflammation? Edema. Edema. Swelling. That takes us to transport. That takes us to transport. So I'm talking in this case, cells, transport, I mean transporting things across the membrane. Going from the outside in, going from the inside out. And if we transport things across the membrane, the inside of the cell is going to become different, right? If things go into the cell, well, then the cell is different on the inside. If things move out of the cell, then the cell is different on the inside. And when the cell changes inside, something's going to happen. So transport in this case is very important. And you'll notice there's two main types of transport. Passive, trans well, passive transport and active transport. I'm not going to put one more there this. Passive transport requires no energy. Passive transport requires no energy. Moving things without energy. How the hell do you do that? No, floating would be not moving at all. Moving things mean like take that chair and move from here to there. Use energy. How do you move something without using energy? Drain. Use what's around you? Gravity? I said drain. Oh, no, that's using energy. Gravity is not using, that's using energy. Gravity is not using energy. So I move that two feet from here to there without using any energy. So passive transport means no energy input. There's three main uh, types of passive transport we have here. That first one is called diffusion. Substances of higher concentration moving through an area of lower concentration. Let me show you what diffusion means. If I take this Lysol and I spray a whole bunch of it right here, crisp linen scent. These particles obviously are going to fall to the ground because of gravity is pulling on it. But they're also going to spread out. Because they're going to go from where there's a lot of particles to where there's less particles. So that soon, Jim, we'll be able to smell Chris Lennon's scent lace salt. Even though I didn't spray it on her, I sprayed it right here. But those particles spread out. If I were to take a helium balloon, those are the balloons that <coughs> float, right? Yes? Yes. They all float down here. If I was to take a helium balloon <laughs> and untie it and open it up, and the helium came out, and the helium just sit right here mm -mm. in a helium shaped bunch of molecules, yeah. what would happen to those molecules? Yes, sir. They would spread out. So they go from where they're plentiful to where they're few. And if we were in an enclosed environment and we didn't have to worry about gravity or wind or anything like that, those particles would move throughout this room until they were evenly distributed all throughout this room. So when we're talking about diffusion in the cell, we're talking about moving across this membrane. So we have a lot of particles on this side of the membrane. <laughs> we have a few on that side of the membrane. As long as those particles can move from this side 
through the membrane to this side, because they're small enough, the openings are big enough, what's going to happen is that they're going to move from where they're plentiful to where there are fewer. Until what happens? They all go back and they all end up in there. No. Because if they go across this way and they start going over here, if they all ended up over here, what would happen? They will move to another place where it's fewer. They'd go back across this side. So what's going to happen is they're going to move until they're equally distributed on both sides. So that if one more goes this way, what's going to happen? You see how that's going to work? They're going to want to be evenly balanced. This is diffusion. This is incredibly important because when we breathe, we breathe this air. How much of this air is oxygen? About 80%. Just oh, under 21% oh, right, of this 20%. air is oxygen. Just under 79% is nitrogen. So when we breathe this air in, we get that just under 21% of ox oxygen into our lungs. Just because it's in our lungs doesn't mean it's inside of our body. We want it to go from there into our blood, the red blood cells. Which means those oxygen molecules have to move across a membrane. Actually, several. So they're going to go from where they're plentiful to where there are few, moving based solely on their size and the fact that there's more here and less here. And that very simple concept is what allows oxygen to go from the inside of our lungs to actually into our blood. That's a huge concept. Diffusion is incredibly important. Good? Good. I'm going to talk about diffusion a lot. No matter what, it will always balance each other. As long as it's they're space. able to. Be spaced to. Yes. Well, we'll call it so closed, certain spaces closed. Well, that would be less likely. Okay. What would be more likely is there might be a time where we have to move more of these over to this side. So. There would be less over here and more over here. Uh, so there are going to be times where that would happen. Now, not necessarily, maybe not with oxygen, but with other particles. In that case, now we have to utilize energy. Because this process is like taking um, a boulder or a bowling ball on the top of a hill. And, and just putting it on top of the hill and just giving it a little tiny push. What's going to happen? It's going to go down. Bro. It's going to race down because of gravity. Yes. No more energy is required. In fact, we call this moving downhill, moving with the concentration gradients, moving downhill, no energy required. But if we have to move things in the opposite direction when they want to go, we say it's moving uphill, like pushing that boulder up the hill. Yeah, more work. More work, exactly, more work. More work will store it as energy, but more work. Good morning, Mr. Child. Good morning. How are you today? I'm okay. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Did, did Ms. Williams come in and talk to you already? Uh, for a moment, she said we're having the awards in the HVAC area. I'm not doing my awards. At 9.30? I'm not doing them either. Do you have anyone? Okay, Janet. so anyone in Purple Scrubs? Janet. We are doing awards at 1. So, um... After your lunch break with Dr. Sturgeon, as long as it's okay with you. I suppose that's fine. So cheer on her classmates. Sure. She absolutely hates me. No. But she's very nice to the students, which is good. Osmosis. That's right. Osmosis. Osmosis is the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Have you considered getting a tattoo? Because this would be a good one to get. Osmosis, the passive movement of water 
across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. <laughs> Osmosis. The passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. If I get that tattoo, do I get an A? <laughs> Maybe, actually. I'll think about that one. Okay. Because that's permanent. Um, osmosis. The passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Now, this is uh, unique. This is a property that is unique to water. And this is why I've said Tuesday, we were talking about macromolecules of nutrition. And I said, most or many people include water as a macromolecule of nutrition, but I keep it separate because it has some very unique characteristics to it. Um, and it is really interesting. The first thing we have to talk about, however, in this definition is a solid. What is a solute? Solid particle substance. A solid particle suspended? Yes, suspended. In a liquid. So what would an example of that be? Glucose. When do we find glucose suspended in a liquid? In a liquid? Like sugar water? Blood? Sugar in the coffee? Salt in water? Like in the ocean? You can't see it. You can't really see it, no. But you can feel it. Because if you go swimming in the ocean and you get out of the water, you just let the sun dry you off, you'll be able to feel the gritty salt on your skin. There'll be sand as well, but you'll be able to feel the gritty salt. And you can certainly taste it. Yes. When you get a sugar packet and you pour it into a cup of coffee and you stir it up, what happens to the sugar? It dissolves. it dissolves into what? When I say dissolves, I mean breaks down. Mm -hmm. What's it break down into? The coffee. It doesn't turn into coffee. It doesn't turn into nothing. We can't take a matter and make it disappear. Smaller particles. So we take big sugar particles and break them down to smaller sugar particles and break those down to smaller sugar particles. But they're still solid. They're still solid particles. And you know this, because I'm sure you've had Kool-Aid. Have you had Kool-Aid before? Mm -hmm. Yes. Make Kool-Aid the old-fashioned way from the little packets and sugar. Mm -hmm. And you stir it up, and you pour a glass of it, and you drink most of it, but you leave about this much in the glass. And you sit down on the counter for a day and a half, and the water evaporates out. White. And what's left behind? The sugar. The sugar at the bottom. All that sugar. Where was that sugar before? In the liquid. It was still in there. It was just dissolved, broken down to smaller pieces. And now the water has evaporated up, so those pieces came together into bigger pieces, into bigger pieces, into bigger pieces, and they precipitated out into a solid. Have you seen these before? Yes. This is a crystal light, uh, natural cherry pomegranate. You pour this into a bottle of water, and it, it makes the water taste like Natural cherry pomegranate. <laughs> and what color does the water become? Red. No. What? You cannot change the property of water. Water is clear. You, this does not change the property of water. Water is clear. However, there are so many tiny little red particles floating in it that it makes the water appear to be what color? Red. Makes the water appear to be red. But if you took a drop of white water out and put it under a strong enough microscope, what you would see is clear liquid, queer, mm, that queer. <laughs> <laughs> clear liquid with a whole bunch of little tiny red dots floating in it. Oh, that's interesting. Well, it is because that's exactly what we see when we look at blood under a microscope. Because blood is red, but why is blood red? Because of the Because there's a whole bunch of small little red solid particles floating in it. So our blood But if we took all the red blood cells out, what color would their blood be? Is it It would be a yellow clearish yeah, yellow. color. The plasma is a yellow clearish color. 
The only reason it's red is because there's so many red particles floating in it. Those red particles, of course, are red blood cells. So osmosis, the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. And now at least we know that solutes are solid particles suspended in a liquid. Does that make sense? Yes. I think it's time for the award ceremony. So we will take a break right now. The permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. And now we understand what a solute is. A solute is a solid particle suspended in a liquid. So let's see what that actually looks like. Or at least in diagram form. So I'll make my beaker of science here. And then down the middle of this beaker, I will put a selectively permeable membrane. In other words, the only thing that can go from this side to this side, this side to this side, are water molecules. That's the only thing this membrane is going to allow. So if I pour water up to here on this side of the beaker, water molecules are going to move from this side to this side until what happens? They even out. Until it ends up looking something like this, right? You can kind of see that happening, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? Permeable, permeable means like passing through? Like <coughs> yeah. Or something? yeah, think of like a, uh, a coffee filter. Mm -hmm. okay. A coffee filter is going to hold back the big grounds, but it's going to let a lot of other stuff through. So selectively permeable means just that, or semi-permeable means just that. It's going to allow some things through, but not other things. So this selectively permeable membrane is only going to allow water molecules to go from here to here. Mm -hmm. If I got four of these packets of crystal white <coughs> natural cherry pomegranate, and I took four of these packets and I put them all on this side, what color is this water going to appear? Red. It's going to appear really red. And if you stuck a straw in it, how would it taste? Yeah. Like, Pretty good. It's a cherry pomegranate. Yeah. But it would be really, it would be really, really cherry pomegranate. Yeah, it would be really, tart. really sweet, really cherry pomegranate. So that's the fusion, right? <clears throat> no, because the, part, the particles are just right here. Okay. All on this side. Oh, so Nothing's moving. Big. The particles can't go from here to here. The only thing that can move across is the water. Okay. So if I put a half of a half of one packet on this side, that would be a quarter. Um, what color is that water going to appear? Pink. Pink. Like a light, light, light pink. Mm -hmm. And if you stuck a straw in it, how would it taste? Yeah. Lightly flavored. flavored. It would pretty much Lightly taste like flavored. water with a little tiny hint of natural cherry pomegranate. So this side. is the low solid concentration. The brackets means uh, concentration. Okay. This side is the high solid concentration. So from the definition of osmosis, osmosis is the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solid concentration to an area of high solid concentration. So this is what's going to happen over time. We have this. Oh, where's my membrane? I'll find it. Put the membrane down the middle. What's going to happen over time is the water is going to move from this side to this side until the concentrations are even. In other words, the colors on both sides are going to be exactly the same. If you suck a straw and taste it both sides, they taste exactly the same. And look what happened to the level of water. It moved up against gravity without using any energy. This is passive. And that's pretty amazing that water can do this. Water is going to move from an area of low solid concentration to an area of high solid concentration until the concentrations are even.
Because remember, the first time I put them in, the first time I put the water in, there was no particles in there. So it just balanced out 50-50. Well, now, because this area is low solid, this area is high solid, water moves across here until both concentrations are the same. Which means when you look at it, they'll be the same color. Which means you taste it, they would taste the same. Does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah. I kind of got So what would you, how did they become higher again? Because the water moves from this side to this side. Mm -hmm. It moves across that membrane. Remember I said the only thing that's allowed to move across here is water? Yes. So water is going to move from here to here. And it wants to do that so simply to make the concentrations even. That's a unique property of water. But how does that so, make the, sorry, go ahead. So in the beginning, it was water in, on both sides. Yes. It just was more crystal light. Yes. In the beginning, the water levels were even. Okay. And then I put a whole bunch of crystal light on this side and just a tiny bit on this side. So the water, because the particles can't move across, just the water can. So the water moved across that membrane to make the concentrations of the solutions even. Well, why didn't you go from right to left? Because I know it's a low to high concentrate, but yes. how does that make them even? That oh, makes, because it's getting... That makes the solutions on both sides even. Gotcha, because it's yeah. the water to the okay. crystal light ratio. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Water to crystal light ratio, exactly. Okay. Okay. All right, so if you think of our cells... We talked about cells. Cells make up all the tissues. Tissues make up organs. Organs make up organ systems. Organ systems make up organisms. If you think of our cells, I said that our cells are surrounded by a membrane, a plasma membrane that is selectively permeable. And I said that inside of our cells, most of the space inside of our cells is taken up by cytoplasm, the jelly-like substance. The jelly-like substance, and that jelly-like substance is made up mostly of water. Oh, water. The, yeah, the cytoplasm is made up mostly of water, which means the inside of the cell is made up mostly of water. But don't we have things inside of our cells? Yes. Those organelles, like the nucleus and ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. You know what those things are? They're solid. They're solid particles in that solution of cytoplasm. So let's look at a cell. But in this case, we'll look at a plant cell. Plant cells are much like our cells. They have some kind of wall around them. Plant cells also have cytoplasm within them, made up mostly of water. Plant cells also have things like a nucleus. They have things like mitochondria. They also have things like glucose, solid particles or fructose. So they have all these solid particles suspended in that liquidy cytoplasm. So let's take a look at this. So here's a giraffe. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm a terrible artist. Oh god. All right, so here's a here's a plant. And of course, plants are in dirt, right? Yeah. Dirt is solid particles. Yeah. And the plant's made up of the stem and the leaves and the flower and the roots down here. So if we looked at one of these roots under a microscope. We would see that the root, just like the rest of the plant, is made up of cells, just like us. And each of these cells is full of cytoplasm, which is made up of water. mostly water. Plus, it has all those other components in it that are like our organelles. And it has solid particles like sugars and proteins and things all in here. And of course, the root is found in dirt, which is solid particles. Dirt. So, when we water this plant, we add water here into the dirt. What did we just create? <clears throat> Mix dirt and water. 
Soil. Solution. Yeah. You mix dirt and water. What do you mud. make? Mud. 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 Oh, sorry. mud. Oh, and what is mud but liquid dirt? Right? That's what mud is. It's dirt that just has a whole lot of extra moisture in it. But what we actually created was this. We created an area with a low solid concentration because it's a lot of liquid. Before it was all solid, just dirt. And we added water. Now it's like a whole bunch of dirt suspended in water. Mud. And, and inside of these cells is now more like this compared to the area outside it, which is more like this. So what's water going to do? Water's going to do what water likes to do. Water's going to move from an area of low solid concentration across a membrane to an area of high solid concentration until the concentrations... Right, until they're even. And if we had one cell, we'd be done. However, now we have this cell here. And this cell here is not in balance with this cell. This cell is now more like this side. This cell is now more like this side. So what's going to happen is water is going to do what water likes to do. Water is going to move from an area of low solid concentration across a selectively fermentable membrane to an area of high solid concentration until the concentrations are even. And if we had just those two cells, we'd be done. But then there's this cell. Now this cell is more like the high solid concentration compared to this cell, which is the lower solid concentration. In other words, there's more water in here than there is in here. So what's going to happen? Water's going to do what water likes to do. It's going to move from an area of low solid concentration across a selectively permeable membrane to an area of high solid concentration until that cell is balanced. And then the same thing's going to happen here and here and here, all the way up the root, all the way up the stem, all the way up the leaves, all the way up to the petals of the flower. It's going to make that entire journey against gravity without using a single bit of energy. Cell by cell by cell by cell by cell. Water's just going to move and balance and move and balance and move and balance. That's pretty amazing. Okay, all the water is all the water is even within the cell. Each cell, correct? It's going to balance. Each cell is going to balance. Okay. Yes. So not okay. There's never going to be more water in this cell than there's in this cell. If there is, then something's going to move from here to here until they're balanced. Uh -huh. So what happens initially to the soil to the water that was in the soil? It's it dries, gonna, it dries it's out gonna, until it all gets... It's going to move into here. So this is going to like yeah, suck yeah. it up. Mm -hmm. okay. So so now this is going to become drier and drier and drier because yeah. the water's moving to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Mm -hmm. Until it's all in balance. Okay. Yes? So there's never a point where when it's moving from here to here to here to here to here that... So like cell A wants to move to cell B. The water. The cell, cell A. Yes. Cell A and B right. are now even. Yes. So then cell B doesn't match cell C, so it evens it's out, itself out. But so cell A and B are half and half. So then you take half of B to put it in C so that they Yes. Match. Yes. But you're still taking water from here. So A, so it just keeps filling. It just keeps moving and then moving and then moving, then moving, then moving, then moving, then moving, then moving until this is gone. So if you put only a tablespoon of water in there, then the water is only going to make it to a certain point and stop. Gotcha. So it would never burst or anything? Like, it would it ever... No, because if you put a whole lot of water in there, like too much water, yeah. then it's all going to become even, so the water is just going to sit in here. So in other words, if you look at your potted plant, it's just going to sit there as mud yeah. for a longer period of time. Yeah. Okay. Because they're all even. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just as God is. Well, I know the problem is, you're like, I didn't come here to study plants. This is stupid. I came here to study people. Well, in my former life, I was an herbalist. Let's look at people. So, here we have a blood vessel. Blood is moving through here. And we know that blood is made up of solid particles and water. And about half of blood is just water. 
And we know there's solid particles in here like red blood cells or, or maybe some white blood cells, some platelets. We also know there's glucose in there, sugar, which is solid. We know there's salt in there, sodium, sodium chloride. We know there's proteins in there. And we know that the blood goes to all the tissues, which is made up of cells. Tissues are made up of cells. And cells are surrounded by a wall. And inside of the cell, there is cytoplasm, which is made up of mostly water. Yes. And then we also have nucleus, ribosomes, mitochondria, solid particles inside of the cells. We have glucose. Remember, we have glucose inside of the cells. We even have salt inside of our cells. We have to have sodium chloride for our cells to function. So let's put some solid particles in here. In this case... In this case, we'll call it salt, just to make it easy. And then, since we have to have salt in our cells, there must be some salt in our blood. So there is. Now, <coughs> today's what? Thursday, tomorrow's Friday. Uh, tomorrow night, you head down to the bar. And you get down there at 7 o'clock, and you sit at the bar, and you order a drink. And the bartender says to you, you're in luck, it's happy hour. And during happy hour, drinks are half price. And while you're sitting at the bar, you also get a bowl full of something to munch on for free. And what do they give you to munch on for free? Pretzels with salt. Peanuts with salt. Nacho chips with salt. Popcorn with salt. So you're sitting there and you're eating. You're munching on these things. And you're putting a whole lot more salt into your body which means you're putting a whole lot more salt into your blood. Now look what you've just, just done. You put a lot more salt into your blood than there was before, solid particles. You've just made your blood into this, the high solid concentration, as compared to the cells here, which are now a lower solid concentration. They don't have as many solid particles. But it has to balance itself out. So what's going to happen? Well, water's going to do what water likes to do. Water's going to move from an area of low solid concentration to an area of high solid concentration. So water is going to move out of the cells the green part is the water into the, the blood. Part is the, cells. the green is the cell membrane oh, okay. around the cells. That's going to cause a process. In science, we call this dehydration. Have you heard of that before? Yes. What does that mean? Lack of water. A loss of water. Dehydration means a loss of water. So these cells are going to dehydrate. So, now they so they're going to shrivel up. Now listen. Because of the salt. Because of the lack, loss of water. Oh, okay. The salt in the blood. The blood became the high solid concentration. The cells, in comparison, are now the low solid concentration. They were balanced before, but you ate all that salt. Mm -hmm. You put a lot more salt in here, so now you created this in your blood. They were balanced, but now your blood looks like this. Your cells look like this. So the water's going to move out of the cells and into the blood. And that's going to cause the cells to create, to shrivel up. Now, you'll remember last week we talked about our body making two things more than anything else, energy and proteins. Yes. And I said in order to make energy, we need things like glucose, oxygen, and water. So if there's, these cells are losing water, are they going to make as much energy? No. no. Is that good or bad? No. That's bad. So these cells are going to send a signal to your brain that says, hey brain, we are dehydrating. Please rehydrate us. And how do you interpret that? Thirsty. I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm parched. Well, luckily, you're at the bar and <laughs> drinks are half price. Do you see how that works? Oh, so that's how they get you to drink more by using salt? I'm just saying. Uh, wow, Scammers. that's decent. They are so that's decent. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, wait, wait a minute. Does everybody understand now, minute, does everybody understand now that water is moving out of the cells and into the blood? Yes. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Hold on, hold on, listen. Just hold your questions. Does everybody understand that water is moving out of the cells and into the blood? Yes. That means that we put more water in our blood than there was before. So consider for a moment, consider for a moment 
a water balloon. If I take a water balloon and I fill it up with just maybe a quarter cup of water and tie it off, just a quarter cup, so it's actually about this big, the whole balloon is about this big, and I'm throwing it back and forth to my friends and it drops on the floor. Is it going to break? No. 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 Probably not. It might, but probably not. Why not? Because the extra air in it. It's going to be bouncy, right? Because that latex uh, balloon, the walls on it are still really thick and they're, they're still bouncy. What if I took that same balloon and filled it to capacity Ooh. with water? The walls are thinner now. Yeah. The walls are thinner. Why? Because you had to stretch it out to fit the water. The water is trying to get out. So it's putting all this pressure on the walls, which is causing the balloon to stretch and stretch, and the walls becoming very thin. Yes. So this here, low pressure. This here, high pressure. And what changed? The amount of water. The amount of water. Let's go back to this. Because okay. when you ate that salt, water moved from the cells into the blood, which means we put more water into the blood. Yeah. So what does that mean for the patient's blood pressure? High. It's going to go up. It's going to go up. This is why we tell people, if you have high blood pressure, Not eat salt. less salt. 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 Mm -hmm. Or if you don't want high blood pressure, eat less salt. Now, does that happen with other um, yeah. salt particles? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Let's see if it does. Because here's my next patient. She is 39 years old. She is uh, five foot nine and a half inches. That's what she'll tell you. I'm five nine and a half. She weighs 112 pounds. Oh, wow. Five foot nine and a half, 112 pounds. She really looks like it. Yeah. That's why I use this as a patient. Mm -hmm. And she constantly complains about being dizzy, lightheaded. We check her blood pressure, and her blood pressure is always chronically less than 90 over 60 millimeters of mercury. In other words, chronic low blood pressure. What are we going to tell her to eat more of? Salt. But doctor, but doctor, she'll say, I thought salt was bad for you. Not for you. Not for you. There you <laughs> go. It's bad for us, but it'll help you. It'll help raise your blood pressure. You won't feel dizzy and lightheaded anymore. Does that make sense? Yes. It does, in fact. Okay, well, let's look at something here. So don't eat this or press your table again. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't eat them anyway because God knows who put their hands in right. They probably have Ebola and gonorrhea, so. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> those two go together. <laughs> All right, here we have our cells. Here we have our blood. We still need a little bit more salt. And not little. Okay, because of course we do need salt, but we don't need that much of it. By the way, you shouldn't even have a salt shaker on your dinner table. Yeah, I don't. Because we that. cook with so much salt, yeah. there's so much salt in the preparation of food mm -hmm. that we shouldn't even have to put salt. We shouldn't even have to add one, just so you know. Okay, we know that blood is full of solid particles plus liquid. We know that the solid particles include things like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and other things like proteins and salt, and also sugar, glucose. So, if we have a certain amount of glucose in here, like we should, and these cells start to run out of glucose, what are they going to do? This is sugar now. I'm sorry? You're yeah. referring to sugar. Now. Sugar, oh. glucose. Okay. What are these cells going to do if they're running out of sugar? Call for more. They're going to call for more. They're going to say, hey, man. <laughs> well, first they're going to call for more sugar. Use that. So the body will say, okay, let's put some more sugar in the blood. Good. Now all that we have to do is get the sugar from the blood into the cells. Who do we need for this? Um, water. The delivery guy. Who's the delivery guy that delivers insulin. Insulin. sugar yeah. to the cells insulin. is insulin. That's our delivery guy. So these guys have called for more sugar. We put more sugar in the blood. Now the delivery guys show up. They take the sugar where it needs to go, punch in the code, sugar goes in, everything's fine, right? Yes. 
However, what if this patient didn't have delivery guidance? No, Is this sugar now going to go into here? No. No. Because remember, glucose doesn't know where to go and it doesn't have the code. Do the cells here know that glucose is right outside the door? No. no. All they know is they're running out of sugar and they've already called for it once. If it's still not there, what are they going to do? Call for it. Hey man, we need sugar. So what's going to happen? Eat more. Eat more. More sugar in the blood. Now is that sugar going to get in? Nope. No. Nope. Because who do we need? Delivery guy. Delivery guy. guy. What's his name? Insulin. Insulin. So these cells still don't get any sugar. They still didn't get any of this that they called for. So what are they going to do? Call for more. Call again. This is called polyphagia. Always hungry or always eating. Polyphagia. That's Always hungry or always eating. Oh, Polyphagia. <laughs> I'm going to explain everything to you. Everything that happens in the so body. It's phage Polyphagia. It technically oh, means to swallow, but in this case swallow. we're saying always hungry or always eating. Polyphagia. Always hungry or always eating. I have that. Polyphagia. Um, always hungry or always eating. This is a clue to you. I've repeated this like four or five times now. Polyphagia. There you go. Picking up on the clue a little bit. Eventually. Polyphagia. Always hungry or always eating. Polyphagia. There's probably even room in your notes to write that down. If you wanted to. Which you do. Because I've repeated it nine times. Polyphagia, always hungry, always eating. So, look at what happened to this person's blood. If we stuck their finger and tested their blood, what would we find? Lots of sugar. Lots of sugar. And who do we see that in? Diabetic, Diabetic patients. But you see, what is the problem here? Is the problem that there's a lot of sugar in their blood? Lack of delivery, guys. The problem is not that there's a lot of sugar in their blood. The problem is the sugar is not getting into the cells. That's the problem in diabetes. This is the result. Does that make sense? The high blood sugar is not the problem. It's the result. However, does it create a problem? Well, let's find out. Because now we have a whole lot of solid particles in the blood. We just created this. Yeah. As compared to this. So what does water want to do? Water is going to do what water wants to do. It's going to move from an area of low solid concentration to an area of high oh, solid concentration. So what's going to happen to those cells? They're going to dehydrate. And when they dehydrate, they're going to send a signal to the brain that says what? I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Polydipsia. Always thirsty or always drinking. Polydipsia. Always thirsty or always drinking. Polydipsia. Always thirsty or always drinking. Polydipsia. Always thirsty, always drinking. Now, what we just did, we just put a whole lot more water into the blood. And of course, kidneys filter the blood. So if there's a lot more water in the blood, there's going to be a lot more filtering of the blood and the water by the kidneys. Which means these patients are going to pee a lot. Polyurea. Always peeing. Polyurea. Always peeing. Because we just put a whole lot more water into their blood. Polyurea. Always peeing. Can I say urinating? Sure. So here's what I want you to realize. If you open up any medical textbook on the planet and you look up diabetes mellitus. They will tell you the first three things you see in any diabetic patient, the first three things that show up 
is polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyuria. Mm -hmm. And that's found in who patient? Diabetic. So it's but all it's about the sugar. Polydipsia people running around. Yes. Now we know the truth, however. Even though those medical textbooks, every medical textbook on the planet, if you look up diabetes mellitus, Every medical textbook will tell you the first three things you see in a diabetic patient is polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. But listen to me, because we know the truth. What's the first thing that person's really going to complain about? What's the first thing that mother is going to say about her kid? He's tired. He's tired. He's always lying around. He has no energy. That's that low energy state. That's actually the first thing that's going to show up. But nobody's going to see that. They're going to make this connection here. And they're going to say, ah, diabetes. That's, what do, that's what's doing this. Now, I have a question for you, knowing what you now know. Would you be at all surprised to find out that if these patients have more water moving into their blood, would you be at all surprised to find out that diabetic patients often have high blood pressure? Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that kind of make sense? In fact, if a patient says to you, I have diabetes, in your head, you might actually start thinking, I wonder if you have high blood pressure too. I, that's not my question. Was Can you have high blood pressure without having diabetes? Certainly. That's what I was Absolutely. So you can have your whole life not being diabetic and having high blood pressure. Correct. Absolutely. I was thought you had to have high blood pressure with diabetes. That's my No, but do you see how they go together? Oh. They absolutely can go together. But a person that has high blood pressure in the absence of diabetes, of oh, course. Yes. Does this make Does this make some sense to you? A little bit of sense. Yeah. I can tell I'm enthusiastic. Trying to make your life easier. It is showing me a lot of I hope so. That's what I want to do. It's a lot different than just reading off of slides, isn't it? Yes. I don't know if it was you. Did you say everyone will develop diabetes at some point in their No, life? everyone will develop cancer. Cancer. At some point yeah, in their life. Yeah. If they live long enough. Cancer. If they live long enough. They'll develop cancer. If you live long enough, cancer will come. Okay. What else do we have in our blood? Well, we talked about red blood cells, white blood cells, talk about glucose, talk about salt. Let's put something else in our blood. Potassium? We do have potassium, absolutely. But I'm talking about something bigger. This is all still osmosis. Oh, that truck now? We haven't gotten off of osmosis. Remember I told you that we're going to spend like two and a half hours just going over these couple of things? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. In our blood, we have a bunch of proteins as well, which makes sense because we make two things more than else, energy and proteins. And of course, to make proteins, we have to break proteins down and build them up, and they're going to become other proteins. So it makes sense that we're going to have some proteins in our blood. This one happens to be called albumin. You don't have to write this down. Just listen. Albumin is a big protein. Albumin is a transport protein. In other words, it can transport a lot of things around the body. It is the most abundant protein we have in our blood, and it's big. It is a big solid particle. What do we know about solid particles? They attract water. Water follows solid particles. You'll hear in people in medicine always say water follows salt. Well, yes, but that's just an indication that water is following solid particles. So if there's a whole bunch of big solid particles in our blood like this, there's going to be a whole bunch of water in our blood because of those big solid particles. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. In fact, How do you pronounce it albumin. It's a big transport protein. It can transport things around our body. 
That's why I got like a big flatbed truck because it can carry a bunch of different things. Now, what if a person doesn't have any proteins in their diet? If you don't get proteins in your diet, can you make new proteins? No, because remember, we have to take those proteins, chop them down into the leg block amino acids, absorb that, and then rebuild them into proteins. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have proteins coming in, we're going to have a hard time making new proteins. So if a person, like those kids with kwashiorkor, remember kwashiorkor means first, second? The first child is displaced from a mother's breast by the birth of a second child, causing the first child to have to sustain oh, yeah. a yeah. no protein diet, just carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So that kid is not getting any proteins coming in, but he still has to make these. So what his body says is, well, we'll take proteins from other places, like muscle. Uh, so it starts breaking down his own muscle as much as it can afford to break down, so it can build it up into these types of proteins. This is why those kids end up with the little tiny skinny arms. But after a while, they start running out of these. Mm. They've broken down all the proteins they can. Now they have less and less of those. Remember, water followed those. Yes. So if those are no longer there, water is no longer going to be there. So what's going to happen is water is going to leave the blood. It's not going to go into the cells. It's going to sit around the cells. Waiting? Yeah, just sitting there. It's just going to collect and collect and collect and cause that area of the body to stretch yeah. and stretch like and their, swell up. Their abdomen? Which is why they have that big round belly. Gotcha. That big round belly is all that fluid that should be in their blood, but isn't. Wow. wow. Now, have you ever seen these kids in person? No, no, no. Of course not. Have you ever examined these kids in person? No. Okay. Have you ever taken any vital signs from these kids in person? No. What do you expect their blood pressure is going to be? Low. Look at that. You already know they're going to have low blood pressure because that water has leaked out of there. It's a visible sign. Mm -hmm. You Not see, visible. what you could do is you could open up a book. Mm -hmm. You could open up a book and read about your core and read the signs and symptoms and put them on a flashcard and memorize. Oh, that's going to have low blood pressure. You can try that, but you might forget it. Mm -hmm. But you see that if you understand what is happening, you already know. You can anticipate what their blood pressure is going to be like because you understand what's happening here. That's what medicine is. That's what we do in medicine. We don't just memorize a whole bunch of facts. We understand how this stuff works. That's why we can anticipate what's going to happen. Now, of course, the body still has to pump all that red blood cells and other nutrients around, but because there's less pressure, it's not going to do it very well. So the body has to try to make up the difference. So what do you think their heart rate is going to be like? Higher. Heart rate is going to be fast to try to pump that stuff around fast. You see how... You have never seen these kids, you've never examined them, you've never taken their vitals, but you already know they're going to be tachycardic and they're going to be hypotensive. Does that make sense? Yes. So what do we need to give these kids? Um, fluids and, and proteins. We need to give them proteins. They're missing proteins. So we need to give them proteins. And in what form do we give them proteins? Beans. Beans, beans and rice. rice. Rice for the carbohydrates, beans for the proteins. Served together. together. Not separately, not beans in the morning or rice at night. You serve them together, you triple the nutritional value. So that's good. Does that make some sense? Yes. A little bit? Yes. Okay. Well then. Is that why African food has a lot of peanuts in it? Um... Because they're easy to grow, yeah, um, and because it's a good source of protein. Yeah, protein. Let's put some more tissue here. More tissue. 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 Okay. That's good. Time's up. Uh, very active. Okay. okay. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. Band. What happened? Where you do that at? Right here. On the tissue. I just injured that tissue. 
right here. Accident. Now I did it Punched in purpose. It. So I injured that tissue. That tissue is now dying. What's it going to do? It's going to call for help. The way a cell calls for help, it releases chemicals. And those chemicals are... Solid. Solids. So it's going to release these little tiny solid particles saying, help me, I'm dying. Who's going to show up? Everyone. Everyone's going to show up. So we have cells specifically right here that will come in to try to help out. And those cells are solids. And we have proteins. Little chemicals that will come in to try to help out. And those proteins are solids. Then we have we have white blood cells in our blood. Now, there's a blood vessel wall here. Blood's in here, white blood cells are in here, red blood cells are in here. They have to somehow get from here to here to try to help out. Solid. So there's chemicals that are released that are going to help to open up the door right here. The and these from the big white blood cells are going to move through here out of the blood to come in to help out. But understand something, these are big white blood cells. Red blood cells are much smaller. And what else is in our blood? Water. So if we've just opened a doorway here, and these white blood cells are coming down here, they're solid particles with all these other solid particles, what else is going to come down here? Water is going to, where's my water? Water is going to follow that down through here, which is going to create what? Well, first of all, what do we call it when everything comes rushing to the scene to help out? Inflammation. We call it inflammation. What follows inflammation? Edema. Swelling. Oh. Edema. So all that water is coming right here because there's all these solid particles here. Now we have oh, swelling true. happening here. And you got a whole lot of red blood cells in our blood, and they're small, and they're flexible, so they're going to get sucked along. Some of the red blood cells. Are going to get sucked along. And that's why what it looks color red. that skin is going to look right there? Red. Oh, my it's going to look red, isn't it? It's going to look red, it's going to look swollen, and it's going to hurt. And the reason it's going to hurt is because we have a nerve right here that is now getting pressed upon. You know, like when somebody touches you and gives pressure, and that yeah. pressure point, you're like, oh, that really hurts. That's what's happening. That nerve is getting pressed upon, which causes pain. So... We want to get rid of that pain. How do we get rid of pain? Well, Medicine. we're going to have to do something to stop this from pressing on all this. So we want to get rid of that fluid, right? But here's the thing. If all I did was stick a needle in here and all I sucked out was just water, but all those solid particles were still there, what would happen? Water's going to come back. Water's going to come right back in there. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of the inflammation. If we get rid of the inflammation, then the water will go away, then the swelling will go away, then the pain will go away. So in order to get rid of the inflammation, we're going to give this patient... Yes. Corticosteroids. That's what corticosteroids do. Corticosteroids stop inflammation. So if there's inflammation in the skin, we're going to give corticosteroids. If there's inflammation in... <laughs> The back, in the muscle, we're going to give corticosteroids. If there's inflammation in around the disc, we're going to inject corticosteroids. If there's inflammation around the knee, we're going to inject corticosteroids. Corticosteroids everywhere gets rid of inflammation. If we get rid of inflammation, we get rid of swelling. If we get rid of swelling, we get rid of pain. Do you see how that works? Yes. Now, let's say um, some kid is out on the soccer field playing soccer, and twist their ankle really bad, what's the first thing you tell that kid to do? Ice it. No, before that. Walk it all Stand. <laughs> Sit down. The first thing you tell them to do is stop playing soccer. Rest your foot. The first thing we tell them is rest it. Then we say, put something on that's cold, like Ice. Ice. 
Why? What does ice do? It How? It does two things. The cold causes this whole thing that's going on here, calling for help, calling for help, calling for help. The cold slows that down. So there's less call for help. If there's less call for help, there's less everything rushing to the scene. Less inflammation. Then the cold does something else. The cold causes the blood vessels to constrict. Smaller. If they're smaller, is there more or less blood going through here? Less. If there's, more, if there's less blood, is there more or less water? Less. Less. Less water going here means less, less water, water going here, which means less inflammation, less, less, less swelling, not inflammation, less, less swelling. Wait, so can you explain that again? You said the Cold ice. does two things. Yeah. The first thing that it does is it slows down the inflammation process. Okay. The cells are going, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. But then that cold makes them go, oh, no. Oh. Uh, everybody, everybody that was rushing to the scene, oh my god, let's go help, is now going, we're going to come to help. <laughs> Everything slows down. So if you slow down that process, you're going to slow down the amount of water that's going to rush there, which is going to slow down the swelling. And the second thing it's going to do is it's going to cause the blood vessels to constrict. If we constrict the blood vessels, less blood means less water. Less water, less swelling. Then we're going to tell them, wrap an ace bandage around it. Nice and snug. We're going to compress that. Oops, we're going to compress that area. What's the compression going to do? Keep well, going. Keep it in yeah. oh, it's, going to pressure. it's going to put pressure on the blood that's moving there, which means there's going to be more or less blood going there. Less blood, less blood means more or less water. Less water means less swelling. Less swelling, less pain. And then we can even tell them, you know what? Why don't you take your leg and elevate it? Oh, to make that less blood come down. Because wow. now, less blood, less water, less swelling. That's the only thing you worry about. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about a strain or like a sprained ankle. I'm yeah, not talking yeah. about a break. But yeah. Wait, is it true when you elevate your, your feet up, it helps the, like, the flow of the blood? Well, what it does is it helps blood return back into the system. Because if I'm standing like this, my blood has to go that was pushed down to my toes, now has to come all the way back up this way, okay. against gravity. And veins are under low pressure, so it's a little more difficult to do. If I'm walking around, I'm constricting these muscles, that's helping to push the blood up. But just standing here, not as easy. But if I'm lying on my back, I have my feet up, well, blood's going to drain with gravity a lot easier, which is going to put it back into circulation. Does the C-stand constrict? What does the C-stand constrict? Compression. Compression. This is why, if you learn anything about sports anywhere, they always say if you have a sprained ankle or an injury, you do the rice. Rest it, stop running around, ice, compression, elevation. But if you understand what is happening, you don't need to memorize this. You'll know exactly what to do. And what's the ace? What? Elevation. What is what? Elevation. I didn't hear what you said. The E. What is the E? Elevation. Yes. Well, you know it already. <laughs> she told me. Right. So does this make some sense? Yes. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. But again, you don't have to know that if you understand what to do. And look how much of that is based upon, upon the movement of water from one area to another area. Yes. All right. You said the infected area signals the um, signal what part to open again. There are specialized cells here that are going to get that nine one one call. That are going to say, "Open up the wall." Okay. Okay. From the wall being open, the water right? From the wall being open. Wall being open, the big white blood cells can come down. That's what the, that's what the body wants. But along with but along with it, exactly, the body wants these guys to come in and help. But it's going to also have to get some water because you can't get a big thing to come through like this without water sucking along with it. And if these red blood cells that are much smaller, much more flexible, are there, they're just going to get sucked along for the ride. Which is going to cause 
What's what's going to cause all this red blood cells? Redness. Redness. Does this make some sense? Those special cells, they wouldn't they wouldn't open up too much. Like they would know, they would know the, exactly how much to allow the white blood cells to come in. More or less. Now the white blood cells are flexible, so they have to sort of squeeze through. Okay. I hate how Specific defense against tissue damage. It begins when injured tissue cells release chemical signals that activate the endothelial cells of nearby capillaries. Within the capillaries, adhesion molecules called selectins are displayed on the activated endothelial cells. These adhesion molecules attract neutrophils, slow them down, and cause the neutrophils to roll along the endothelium. As the neutrophils roll along the endothelium, they encounter chemicals that activate integrins, which are adhesion receptors on their surfaces. These integrins then tightly attach to adhesion receptor molecules on the endothelial cells. This causes the neutrophils to stick to the endothelium and stop rolling. This accumulation of neutrophils along the walls of the capillary is referred to as margination. The inflammatory mediators released by the injured tissue bring about changes in the environment that cause mast cells to degranulate and release histamine. Histamine causes vasodilation and an opening of the junctions between the endothelial cells, allowing fluid and leukocytes to leave the capillary and enter the infected tissue. The neutrophils now undergo dramatic changes in shape and squeeze through the endothelial wall into the interstitial tissue fluid. This process is called extravasation. The neutrophils, followed by other types of phagocytes, are attracted to the damaged site by chemopathic substances released by bacteria and tissue breakdown products. They ingest and destroy invading bacteria. So did you see how the mast cells that were there, let's go back to where it was there. The, these mast cells that are always just hanging out in the tissue, these are alarm cells. Remember I said all the alarms and everything is in the skin? Mm -hmm. uh, these are some of those. These release a chemical called histamine, which you've probably heard of before, yes. or at, least, at the very least you've heard of antihistamine before, mm -hmm. which is going to stop them from releasing, those, uh, releasing histamine, which is going to stop all that from happening. So the splinter coming in caused the tissue damage, which caused the chemical to be released here. That's the 911 call, which activates all of these things here to get the white blood cells to stop in this vicinity. Because remember, blood's moving through here pretty quickly. Yes. White blood cells are sort of on the periphery, kind of rolling along, but they're still moving kind of quickly. So we have to have something that's going to say, okay, wait right here. This is the this is this place you need to be. Then the histamine causes in the tissue here causes the walls to open up. Uh, we also have cells in our blood that release histamine that's going to cause the walls to open up on this side. And then that's going to allow those white blood cells to squeeze through and come up and try and help out the situation. But did you notice how the fluid also leaked out through here? Yes. And if there were red blood cells in here, you'd see them get sucked out and go to this area also. So you see how this is exactly what I explained on the board. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much. Now the white blood cells they ate a, they ate away at the uh, the signaling part. Like, they ate it away the bacteria. Yeah. Okay. That was okay. That was bacteria. Not yeah. the Not the the, uh, the signal for the. No. Okay. No. They were getting signals that there was a problem, and they were getting signals in the form of um, this products from the bacteria, and so they knew where to go for the bacteria. Just so they, they literally go in and they eat the bacteria, they go in and gulp the, the bacteria. Okay. We call it phagocytosis. And they're going to get rid of them later, hopefully. That's why every time you get a splinter, you don't get an infection. Because we have those things that are going to come in and help out and destroy as much bacteria as possible. But what if there's a lot of bacteria? Do you have an infection? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So if you get a splinter, what do you do after you take the splinter out? Clean it. There you go. You want to clean as much Bacteria away as possible. And what do you use to clean it with? No. Water. Alcohol? Water. No. Oh, um, saline. No. Do what? You use more water. Soap and water. Soap and water is still the best. Okay. If hydrogen peroxide doesn't really help, 
Um, we use it for debridement, but it doesn't really help in getting rid of the bacteria. It doesn't decrease bacterial count. What about alcohol? Alcohol will help, but alcohol also destroys some good cells. Oh. So we don't want to use alcohol if we can help it. Soap and water is still the best. It doesn't make a difference what kind of soap. It doesn't have to be an antibacterial soap. Just soap and water. And what property does soap have? What is no? What is so special about soap? So it's mean. How? It's like it's soapy. It's soapy. Yes. <laughs> soap is slippery. Mm -hmm. That's what's special about soap. Mm -hmm. So when you get that bubbly soap all over your hands with water, and then you put that soap. Soapy, bubbly hands underwater, what happens? It's it it's rinses right. away because soap is slippery and it causes all those other things to rinse away with it. That's what it does. It attaches those things and says, makes them slippery so they rinse away. So any dirt that's there that has bacteria attached to it is going to rinse away. And that's what we want. Wow, that's so weird. Still, soap and water is the best. Not how to approach it. Okay, I think we can pause. Right. If you have another. I mean, a um, monster costume for Halloween. Our carpool box. Not carpool box. The full board from Dollar Tree. Uh huh, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yes. Go five, four, three, two, one. Start. Zero. Five, four, three, two, one. Start. Okay. We talked about osmosis, right? A little bit. Yeah, a lot of You now know that osmosis is the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solid concentration to an area of high solid concentration. We know that a solid is a solid particle suspended in a liquid. We know that blood is red because it is full of red blood cells. That's why it appears to be red. So those are two examples of passive transport. The third example I have here is filtration. Now filtration, we'll talk about in a little more detail when we get to the kidneys. In this case, we're going to have a force being applied that's going to push water and fluid across a membrane along with solid particles. And that force is still not going to use any energy. It's still passive. The force is the force of blood pressure in that case. So that's all you need to know about filtration for right now. That's a good one. We're going to go to page 21 then. On page 21, if you happen to have the notes in front of you, remember they are not necessary for success in this course. They're merely offered as a convenience. Similar information we found in other textbook reference materials. <coughs> and what you see at the top of that page is active transport. Never mind, I found it. Active transport means that we're going to move things against their concentration gradient. Active transport means we're going to require energy. And of course, what do we use as energy? ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Yes? Yes is the answer. Adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine with three phosphate molecules attached to it. ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's the molecule that we're constantly building and then constantly using and then constantly rebuilding and then constantly using. So 
In this case, normally we would say, well, diffusion was going to say that we're going to have these particles move with their concentration gradient, move downhill. It requires no energy. But there's going to be times in our body where we are going to want to take some of the ones from this side, for instance, and push them this way. That is going against their concentration gradient. That is moving those particles uphill, which means it requires More. energy, ATP. That is what we call active transport. So if you ever see a test question and it talks about something needs energy, something requires energy, something needs ATP or requires ATP, you know they're meaning this is a form of active transport. Passive transport, no energy required. Active transport needs energy. Underneath that, you see endocytosis, yes? Correct. Endocytosis moving large substances into a cell. So it's not something that's going to move through a membrane. We're going to move bigger things into the cell. Like we saw in the video, we saw those neutrophils, those white blood cells, going out and engulfing the bacteria. So what happens is a white blood cell comes across a bacterium, recognizes him that he doesn't belong because he doesn't look like our other cells. So he's going to reach out and around. That's why I put the orange here. It represents this area of the membrane. So he's going to reach out and around and engulf this bacterium and then come back together again. So the membrane comes out all the way around. What that means is the bacterium is inside a compartment inside of the cell. He is not inside of here, in the cytoplasm. The reason for that is because if he was in the cytoplasm, he could damage the cell. And of course, if he's in the cell, well that means the inside of the cell is different. If the inside of the cell is different, something could happen. So he is going to be inside of a compartment that has been created inside of the cell. Bacteria. Or anything that doesn't belong, but in this case we're saying a bacteria. So you notice, I, I put the orange here just to represent this part of the membrane so you can see what's happening. That it's sort of coming out and around this way and then just engulfing it completely and, and pinching off and sealing together and creating an entire compartment. Meanwhile, since the cell knows he's getting a bad guy coming in, he better mix up some kind of poison, some kind of Lysol to destroy him. So he creates a purple Lysol that is going to be transported over to where he now is. Remember the lysosomes? Lysosomes are transporting lysol, they're transporting some kind of digestive enzyme that's going to destroy things like bacteria. So, as it knows, there's a bacteria here, he says, well, I better mix up something to get rid of them. And he mixes this substance up, transports it over here, and now the lysosome fuses with this capsule that was created, this little compartment. That way it all still stays in here. It doesn't mix into the cytoplasm. And the bacterium gets destroyed, broken down. We call this, this type of endocytosis, we call this phagocytosis, or cell eating. Phagocytosis, cell eating. <clears throat> in some cases, the cell wants to take in a whole bunch of little tiny particles suspended in a liquid. So it'll reach out and it'll grab all these little tiny particles all at once. They're particles that are suspended in a liquid. So if you were to look at this under a microscope, it would look like it was just taking a big gulp of liquid. But if you look closer and closer into that gulp of liquid, you actually find there's tiny particles in there. But because it looks like it's taking a big gulp of liquid, we call that cell drinking. Penocytosis. Both of these are endocytosis, taking things within into the cell. Phagocytosis, cell eating. Phenocytosis, cell drinking. Wait, so a wire is different? Like, okay, I'm trying to think of how to word my question why I'm confused. Taking a big solid particle, yeah. phagocytosis, it's eating. Gotcha. Taking in a bunch of small particles suspended in liquid. Oh, suspended in liquid. Okay. Phenocytosis, cell gotcha. drinking. 
So again, the first time investigators looked at this stuff under a microscope and saw this happening, they could see it engulfing the bacteria. It says, oh, it looks like it's eating the bacteria, a big solid particle. But then you could also see it reach out and take in a big gulp of liquid. And they think, well, it looks like it's drinking. But actually, if you look closer at the liquid, you find out that there's a whole bunch of small solid particles within that liquid. But they still called it cell drinking, penocytosis. Then once it breaks down this bacterium, for instance, now it can get rid of these particles by doing the opposite, doing this in reverse, and releasing them to the outside. Or whatever's created here, oh, I have purple and green. it can move this way and fuse with the membrane like this. And then that would release that substance out of the cell. That's called exocytosis. The stuff is exiting the cell. Because it don't need it anymore. It for, what, need for whatever it. reason, it's releasing it out of the cell. Why didn't it take it in then if it's just going to release it back out? Well, because it might take in the bacterium and then mm -hmm. destroy it and then get rid of the particles. Oh, that are okay. no longer dangerous. But so the particles are going into what's the green blacky blobby? <laughs> this is in this case, this is just a lysosome. Okay. So the lysosome is going and attaching to that particle, killing it, taking in the small particles into the lysosome, and then using the no, lysosome. Not, to no, no, the lysosome's fusing here and it's releasing all that substance in this compartment <laughs> to kill the bacteria. Okay. But then you said it in, has to go. I'm saying in this case. It's, this is a lysosome, or this might be something else. Maybe a hormone was created inside of the cell. So the cell creates the hormone, like estrogen or something, and when it creates that hormone, maybe not, maybe not that hormone, but some hormone, or some substance, and that needs to go into the blood. So now it will transport that substance to the edge of the cell, which will bind with the cell and release it into the blood. The what? Do you call it? Lysosome. Lysosome. The lysosome. It don't have to be lysosome. It could be. It could uh, be any transport. Be, okay. Okay. Anything that would help. Help. You know. Help get that bacteria. And again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit of this, but this is why cell biology gets such a bad rap. This is why people don't like cell biology, because it's complicated and you can't see it and all kind of stuff like that. Okay, let's see. Let's look at lysosomes first. Look at this video. Look up here, not down there. This whole thing is representing a cell. This here is outside of the cell. This is the cell membrane, which means all the yellow is cytoplasm. Here's the nucleus. Here's endoplasmic reticulum. You can see rough ER and smooth ER. Here are individual ribosomes. Here's the Golgi apparatus, or Golgi body. Here's mitochondria. And these are would represent lysos these would represent lysosomes. So watch what happens. Lysosomes are membrane-bound vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. These enzymes digest particles or cells taken into the cell by phagocytosis. They also digest old organelles such as mitochondria. The hydrolytic enzymes that degrade proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates are formed in the endoplasmic reticulum and then transported to the Golgi apparatus by transport vesicles. The lysosomes arise from the Golgi apparatus. When particles such as viruses or bacteria are ingested by phagocytosis, the lysosome fuses with the particle-containing vesicle, called a phagosome, and delivers the hydrolytic enzymes. So it fuses with that, which means it all stays within this compartment. That way it does not mix with inside of the cell here. Mm -hmm. They call it hydrolytic enzymes, I call it lysol. Lysosomes also fuse with organelles such as defective or worn-out mitochondria. This results in the destruction and recycling of these structures. All right, and then I'll show you in... So, 
Sometimes people have a lot of swelling in their legs. Have you mm -hmm. seen this before? This type of edema is called pitting edema, especially if they have like a decreased cardiac function. So when they're walking around, they're sitting, they're walking around, most of them standing on their feet. They have a lot of swelling in their feet and ankles. And the doctor will say, well, sit down, relax, put your legs up. And then we might give them that water pill. We might give them that hydrochlorothiazide. Because what does that water pill do? It makes them pee. pee out a lot of water. So if they took their blood and we caused them to pee out a lot of water, then their blood becomes more like that area of um, high solid concentration. It's dehydrated. We're literally going to dehydrate their blood by having them pee out a lot of the water part of their blood. Which means now all that fluid that's sitting in those tissues is going to move out of the tissues into the blood because we've dehydrated it. So it's going to move to those more solid particles, which means the swelling is going to go down. And then, of course, we can, if you want to move, take out more water, we just give them more of those, more of that medication. We're going to squirt a lactone. And that's nice diuretics. What's that? And that's diuretics. That's diuretics. Diuretics make you pee. You know, your, your kidneys filter blood, right? Yeah. And it filters out a lot of the waste products that we've created, metabolic waste products. But in the process, we also actually lose a whole lot of water, a huge amount of water in that process. Think of this. If you think of a swimming pool, the water in that swimming pool goes through a filter, and that filter traps things like leaves and twigs and things like that. And then the water comes back into the pool. Clean, right? That's the idea. Most of that water comes back into the pool. You're going to lose a little bit of water in the pipes. You're going to lose a little bit in the filter. But most of the water goes out, gets clean, comes back in. That's what our kidneys do. We have the blood that goes through the kidneys. We lose a lot of water. We lose a lot of other particles. But then our kidneys have the ability to say, no, bring, some, bring that water back in. So about 98% of the water that we filter out of our kidneys, about 90% of that water comes back into our system. Imagine what would happen if you had a swimming pool where the water went out of the swimming pool through a filter but never came back into the pool. It would what, drain pretty quick. What would happen? It would drain pretty quick. Yeah, you'd have to keep a hose in it and keep water filling up because it would constantly be draining. So that's what would happen to us. So we actually bring about 90% of that water back into our system. Otherwise, we would constantly be draining. We would constantly be totally dehydrated. Well, what the water pill does is it allows a lot of that water to escape rather than coming back in. Can I ask a question? Yeah. It's not a question. Sure. Um, do doctors really give placebo, like fake pills to people with disabilities? No. Oh. Well, there was a time, but not anymore. So when is that always like? Probably when the lawyers started. <laughs> Because if somebody found out that they were given a medication that wasn't a medication that was approved for something, oh, you know what? I actually, I kind of lied to you a little bit, didn't I? <laughs> Crap. I apologize. We do get placebo. Basically, it's a placebo. Sort of a placebo. Kind of a placebo. Diet pills? Sort of. Diet pills? No. Birth control pills. Oh, um, yeah, because it tricks the body. Well, no, is it, but isn't there a week? Yeah. In that packet? That's a placebo pill. Really not 